would like to start now the presentation. And for those of you who maybe are not too familiar with Henlian Partners, we are the leading institution uh, when it comes to investment migration. Um, we have been in the sector operating now since more than 25 years successfully, serviced thousands of clients. We have 45 offices worldwide. And uh, because of the expertise and the competence the firm has been gathered over the past decades, we also have a very thriving government advisory practice, which is designed to help governments or government entities promote, implement, execute uh, these programs that we will talk about. If you think about investment migration, uh, there are a lot of leading, as we call them, residents and or citizenship programs available. And actually, it's quite an amazing global footprint if you if you see that. Some of those we will talk about today. Um, but for Henley, as the leading institution in that field, we got you covered. With our 45 practices worldwide, we are literally in every of these very attractive jurisdictions and markets. And what we can provide to clients and their advisors is an end-to-end -end service uh, running successful applications for a program of their choice. Now, today, um, maybe a bit different to other webinars that we had in the past, we would like to talk about a key publication uh, that we have been uh, publishing since quite some years now. And it's our effort to create an independent and transparent, I think, and fair ranking of all of these programs because still there are residents by investment or citizenship by investment programs that differ in detail. And we thought it's important to engage leading academic researchers, country with specialists, economists, immigration attorneys, independent advisors to come together and help us sort of creating a standard, a methodology that is systematic and transparent in ranking these programs. Good news, you can actually purchase that publication. It's quite a big book and pretty heavy on Amazon. And I'd also like to invite you to go on our website and uh, play a little bit with the interactive tool that we have where you can dive further into the insights of this publication. Um, important at this stage is that it's not only about the two indexes. Uh, the entire publication is enriched with amazing context, insights of subject matter experts in a very bite-sized fashion. So, you know, it doesn't really take a lot of time, but you will find either you are a client yourself, a practitioner, or just want to learn more about investment migration. It doesn't take a lot to really create a great level of knowledge. Now, what are these indexes? You know, you can see the Global Residence Program Index, which consists this edition of 26 different countries. So all of these countries do have a legislation in place that allows residents against investment in the wider sense. For today, we will focus on three of these countries, which is Portugal, Greece, and Spain. You can see why my colleagues are on this call. Um, important here on the ranking and the methodology, there are key parameters, or we call them key factors, that actually can um, provide a strength or weakness assessment. Of a, of a certain investment, residence investment program. Reputation is actually very important because it stands for the respect, I believe, and the sort of embedment into the international community. It also stands for FDI attractiveness, quality of life, of course. If you want to obtain a residence abroad, you also want to make sure you upgrade your quality of life. Some clients, or the wider question is, does this residence program maybe also have an attractive pathway to citizenship? So you can see that these parameters are sort of benchmarked against all of these programs, and some might score a bit higher, some might score a bit lower. We have done the same with the Citizenship Program Index. Here, 13 countries, very similar but different uh, parameters. For instance, visa-free access, of course, very important. Once you are naturalized and you receive a passport, what does it actually do? In that context, also, please feel free to go again on our website, yeah. familiarize yourself with the Henley Passport Index, probably the institutional tool that allows you to understand and to compare what the strength of your passport actually does in terms of visa-free access. Um, yeah, you want to do a citizenship by investment program. Does it have requirements for residence or physical stay requirements? Important consideration, for instance. And, and or what are the investment criteria? Right. So all of these have been benchmarked with a score of one being not so strong towards 10, very, very strong. And that leads to an aggregation of maximum 100 points. And in this example here, we can see that Malta stands out for today. We will talk about it indeed. We want to talk about Malta. We're going to talk about Antigua and Barbuda. 
and we want to talk about Grenada. Um, so the publication itself comes then in a very uh, systemic presentation. You see on the left side bottom here the spider diagram with all these points and the key factors. You see our program description and you also see some very top level information about these things. Now, what I want to know if we look into Portugal, you know, and congratulations, Amy, by leading the race here. Um, Portugal wins with 75 points. And one of the things that really stands out is the quality of life with nine out of 10, something that international investors and clients, you know, probably are very looking at because that means, you know, value. Um, tell us something more. What is the quality of life in Portugal? Okay. Thank you, Philip. Uh, what can I say? Portugal is a beautiful country. Today, the sun is shining. Um, and you could say to me, okay, my colleagues are also going to say they've got 300 days of sunshine. It's true. Uh, so I can't just fix on the sun and how beautiful the country is. Uh, Portugal actually has been ranked uh, in the global quality life indexes for several years now for certain uh, reasons. The mild climate, I've just said it, the high level of security, the safety, the healthcare system, the overall well-being making us the most friendliest and welcoming countries in the world, accepting all nationalities and religions. Uh, being a Portuguese South African, that's the reason why I left South Africa, the security, uh, you know, being able to walk in the street and not looking over your shoulder, uh, walking at night, uh, driving, uh, all that, um, you know, ticked the box when I chose Portugal. And then again, I want to speak a bit about what's happened on Sunday. Uh, we had our elections, our legislative elections on Sunday. And for 50 years, the Portuguese have voted the same two political parties. So it gives us stability. OK, uh, you know, quality of life is also stability. The government, you know, as the Europeans are all going far, far right, we stayed to the same two parties. So I think all that ticks the boxes of quality of life. And Portugal is a peaceful nation, neutral and welcoming. I think that's that's the, the, the main points of quality of life. Excellent. I've Excellent. got much more Thank to say. So <laughs> yeah, and we're going to talk about this later yeah, in our exactly. panel conversation because there's much more to actually unpack, uh, not only pertaining the data, but about the process and you know the latest changes that we have seen. So let's hold on our breath. We'll talk about this later. But uh, I would like to now to go to Greece. Marios, who actually represents, you know, second place, uh, scoring of 73. When I analyzed the data, one thing that I actually saw here standing out quite extraordinary is the processing time. It appears that the Greek golden visa process itself is pretty efficient time-wise. And Marios, maybe you can just, you know, elaborate on that a little bit further. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Philippe. Um, actually, yes, um, Greece is very, very competitive in terms of uh, processing time. Uh, compared to other European and non-European programs, because you can get the golden visa as uh, as fast as in like four to four and a half months. And um, one of the key parameters to this, uh, let's say, success in terms of uh, the processing time is that, first of all, it's not that complicated to open a bank account. Uh, the Greek financial institutions, the systemic ones, have become much more lenient and flexible, uh, always, of course, respecting the KYC requirements in terms of opening uh, uh, the bank account. And secondly, Philippe, and I think this is the most mm -hmm. important, uh, the Greek Golden Visa uh, is a key uh, player and plays a very vital role in terms of, uh, because you mentioned before the word FDI in, in Greece, which means uh, that the Greek government, which is also very, very stable, uh, uh, as Amy mentioned as well for the Portuguese one, uh, is very much pro-FDI. And one of the key tools to promote FDI, foreign direct investment in Greece, is actually the Greek Golden Visa. So both uh, submitting mm. the applications as well as the approvals uh, from for, for, the gold, for the applicants who are um, submitting the applications for the Golden Visa are very, very uh, fast and uh, smooth. Okay, excellent. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the technicalities later in our panel conversation i think there are a lot of amazing insights and competence that you can bring to the table which is relevant for our audience um i would like to go to spain which is you know uh, a big country uh, very beautiful as well the sun is shining there too <laughs> looking at the data again assessed by you know independent research 
and subject matter experts. One of the things that stand out to me, even though the scoring is 69, congratulations on that, the reputation. Uh, from my understanding, you know, Spain has a great reputation, but maybe you can tell a bit more about that and how does this relevant, you know, how does how is this relevant to actually our clients? Well, it is relevant um, basically because of the reasons of the good reputation, which are several. Uh, first of all, it would be, I would say, the strong economy. Spain's economy has showed a steady growth and it's projected to grow the most in 2024. Um, it is its engagement with international organizations, uh, which also gives a good reputation to a country, the commitment to human rights that Spain has shown over the years, and the alignment uh, with democratic values that the country has. So I believe all of those give the country a pretty good reputation. And when you're gonna become a resident of a country, you want that country to offer all of this. Excellent, thank you so much for that. So for our audience here on this call today, there are 23 more countries available in our publication. So you know, if some of those countries that you're interested in have not been covered on the residence index now, please you know, type in the chat box or go on the website, purchase on Amazon, uh, or just ask us a, a question later whenever you wish. Let's move on to the citizenship index, which again, similar methodology, somewhat slightly different parameters, but there's a winner. And the winner is Malta uh, with a staggering 77 out of 100. Serene, you're based in Malta. You know the program inside out. You have been with the industry since many, many years. But I can see that compliance and visa-free travel as being the key drivers of Malta's success. What are your thoughts? It is indeed. Uh, thank you for your question, Philippe. Uh, well, it is the only process within the EU that will lead you directly to citizenship in a very short period of time. So we have to say an application takes between 14 to 16 months to be fully finalized. And this is when applicants will become citizens of Malta. Um, it's been always renowned for its stability as well. It's a very safe country to live in. Um, and it's... Um, it grants you access, uh, visa free access or visa on arrival for 190 countries. Mm. Um, the fact that this is a very safe place to settle down in is quite reassuring for our clients. And it's always been a very popular um, program that, that has been going on now for um, past 10 years. Let's put it that way. Um, as you know, Malta also is well known for its strict due diligence processes. And uh, the best of all is holding a multi-citizenship would allow our clients to settle down uh, within the EU or the Schengen area, mainly uh, for their children to study in Paris and Milan and anywhere in the EU. Um, this is one of the main reasons our clients choose to go with Malta. Thank you very much, uh, Serene. I, I think uh, we all can agree, you know, compliance standards, uh, governance are important factors in this uh, consideration. And so pleased to see that Malta's, you know, practice here is uh, very well appreciated by the people who have put together this independent piece of research. Um, everybody was saying, not everybody, but a lot of you were saying the sun is shining. Now the sun is shining here as well, but it's also shining in the Caribbean. But uh, um, if we look into the Next country here, Antigua and Barbuda, ranking a bit behind, still 70 points, ranking third. Uh, it has its perks, it has its advantages. It's a bit further away in the Caribbean. But, you know, um, when you look into, let's say, residence option, which appears here to be, you know, very well reflected, um, or investment categories, you know, you have been advising more than 200 families throughout your career. What do you have to say here? Yes, well, uh, Antigua, is, it's, it's a beautiful island. It's an Eastern Caribbean hub. Uh, it's also the most touristic island, but they are unique in a way that uh, they're requiring from their applicants to visit the island uh, once in first five years of holding the passport in uh, uh, amount of five days. And then, then the passport is extended for another 10 years. While my, some applicants might consider this as a disadvantage, it is actually an advantage as you will get to know your country and uh, you will also use that opportunity to pass the oath of allegiance while, while you are there. On the investment side, um, it's, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a hub, it's a, it's a Caribbean hub. 
It's uh, an island which is uh, very well connected with uh, Northern America and Europe. And um, it really makes sense to own a home there or, um, or to live there if preferred so, uh, as uh, it's a place where you can spend the whole year enjoying the Caribbean wines. Mm. Excellent. And if we talk about Grenada, which same place, same scoring, but slightly different composition, how to actually gain those points. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the, these programs, in essence, they are the same. They give you the, the main advantages are, are, are the same, but there are some preferences which each island has uh, over the other one. Uh, Grenada has something very unique, and this is that it has a, a visa free access to China, Russia, uh, UK, and the EU. Uh, you can visit all these territories, regions uh, with a Grenadian passport. With Antigua, you cannot, at least not uh, to China and Russia. Uh, Grenada has also something uh, unique with what other islands do not have. This is the US E2 Tax Treaty visa. Antigua does not. Uh, Grenada has no residency requirements. Antigua, as said previously, it does. Uh, but on the other side, Antigua is more touristic. It has better infrastructure. It, it's more affordable um, uh, for families. Uh, definitely faster processing and uh, passports after five years are issued for 10 years. So mm -hmm. in comparison, yes, they are, they are ranking, uh, they are ranked the same score, but uh, each one has own specific advantages. Thank you very much. And I guess also here, you know, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more technical um, in, in, in our panel conversation. Now, we have introduced six uh, programs. We have introduced a little bit the, the ranking methodology. We gave a top-level insight. But I would like the audience, again, to understand what the motivation was behind this ranking, which now is um, multiple years, actually, we published this uh, uh, sort of, you know, compendium. And again, the, the motivation that we have in mind is to provide a fair, transparent benchmarking that comes in a systematic sort of research methodology. And um, it is relevant for anyone who wants to be involved in investment migration, whether as an investor, uh, whether as a client, whether as an advisor, or whether as a policymaker at a certain government. So we really encourage you to, you know, um, go on the website, uh, play with interactive tool. It provides you a lot of insights that actually maybe even can change or strengthen your perception of a certain program. And with that, I think we now had uh, 21 minutes or 20 minutes down. I would like to actually close the session, um, invite you, of course, to engage in the chat function because we're going to leave now the presentation into an open conversation. We already have received a few questions which are popping up here. So please make use of this and challenge us, ask us questions while we are actually going a bit more into details on these certain uh, programs. Um, I'll probably go back to the winner, uh, <laughs> Emmy. Portugal okay. has been very popular um, throughout the years. And uh, you know there also have been a few changes uh, that we have seen. Um, but from your perspective, and maybe building also on the ranking, what are the key drivers that beyond the quality of life have made Portugal so successful? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Philippe. I can start by saying that with the Golden Residence Permit Program, uh, you can live in Portugal, you can work in Portugal, and your children can study in Portugal. Whether it's a public uh, Portuguese, uh, Portuguese school, international school, the uh, universities, you can study. So you have the right to all of that. Of course, you've also got the right to the Schengen area, which most of our uh, residence programs have as well. And after five years of residence, and I will touch on the citizenship amendment law uh, next, uh, you can apply for citizenship. Of course, the first five years is a residency program. It's a temporary residency program, but you are eligible for citizenship after five years. So um, I'll, I like to explain it as there's so, so many positives, right, that I spoke about in the beginning on Portugal. And it's a little bit like codfish. You know, codfish is, um, we are the biggest importers of codfish. And we can do 1,001 ways of doing codfish. 
And I could come up with 1,001 ways of why Portugal is popular. So uh, there's a number of uh, reasons. Uh, the tourism, the food, the wine, a cultural heritage. We are one of the oldest countries in Europe. Uh, the hospitality, the investment opportunities. I mean, the, as you said, rightly said, this government has changed the options and made them attractive. Uh, minimum thresholds of 250, 200 even uh, K. Uh, to for the program. So, um, you know, the surfing, the outdoor activities, the education, which I mentioned, uh, healthcare, uh, all our clients have the same healthcare as we Portuguese do. You can go into our Portuguese hospitals and doctors um, like a Portuguese citizen can. Uh, music, fado, uh, the language, everyone speaks uh, English in Portugal. So, like I said, I could come up with, you know, 1001 reasons why to choose Portugal. Um, so I think that sums it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, very, I could do very a good. webinar on Portugal. <laughs> I, I know, and I have a few more questions for you later. In fact, okay. there are a few questions already popping up in the chat, so uh, we build yes. on that a bit later. But mm -hmm. um, now, talking about Malta, Serene, um, you know, the Malta citizenship by it's a mouthful, naturalization for exceptional services by direct investment is also on the top of the ranking, right? Um, now, we heard what are the drivers for Portugal being the, on the top score from your perspective. Why do you think the small are so successful attracting high net worth, ultra high net worth clients obtaining citizenship by investment? Well, Philippe, as I mentioned previously, um, holding a Maltese citizenship um, allows you to either settle down in Malta or decide to go settle down anywhere else within the EU. Um, you can also locally benefit from the healthcare system once you become a Maltese citizen. Um, also, university, uh, the university locally would be free for multi-citizens. Uh, it's also a very attractive place to live. We're going to mention the sunshine again, uh, the quality of life, the kindness of the locals. Um, it's got excellent air links. Within two hours or within an hour, you are in uh, Sicily, you are in Spain, and so on. Um, and I think the most important thing is English is the main spoken language in Malta. So it is very, very easy to people to, for people to settle down um, here, open businesses here, um, school their children here, and so on. Very, very good. Uh, a few technicalities are relevant for the program, but you know, we, we go through a little bit, you know, we, we, we a country journey. Um, and we talked about Portugal's advantage, you know. I want to hear about Spain. Um, citizenship is has been mentioned twice here already by Portugal and by Malta. How does the Spanish program compare to that? Does it lead to citizenship? And if it does, what is the process, Ines? Yes. So if the resident effectively lives in Spain for a continuous number of years, there will be a path to citizenship. Um, depending on the nationality, it will be 10 years, but this is especially interesting for certain nationalities that I'm going to mention that get the benefit of after residing for two years in Spain, you can apply for citizenship. And this is Ibero-American countries, so basically Latin America and countries who have Spanish as their main language, then the Philippines, France, Portugal, Equatorial Guinea, and um, and also Sephardic Jews can benefit from this fast track to citizenship after two years. And that would mean living in Spain for two years, if I'm right. Yes, so there's a number of years that you have to live in the country to be considered uh, for nationality as an effective resident. But it is also important to note that when you become a resident by investment, you are not necessarily required to spend that amount of time in the country. It is a choice that you have. So you have the option to either effectively reside in Spain for more than half of the year, which will have other consequences and benefits, or you can choose mm -hmm. to just not live here and basically just visit Spain to get your Spanish card and then to renew it and right. don't need to come back. Excellent. Interesting. Amy, you know, citizenship, residence, there has been changes, as you just mentioned, in Portugal, uh, changes that have been uh, perceived very well within, you know, investors who are maybe considering to initiate the process or those who are going through the process. Uh, can you tell us something about this? 
Yes, definitely. Uh, very good news uh, for clients that have submitted their application. Um, they've changed the citizenship law. It's already been published uh, on the 5th of March, will be coming into effect on the 1st of April. And um, what does that mean in reality? Uh, it's They're going to start counting from the day that you submit your application to the government. So today, it's when you actually receive the physical residence card in your hand, and then you count the five years. And they're going to change it, so it's when you actually submit your application. Now, there's all these question marks, right? Portugal is never black and white, all there's a lot of gray. Uh, so we just need to wait. Uh, is it going to be when we do the online submission and you pay the government analysis fees? Or is it going to be when you actually come and do your biometrics and they take your photograph, the, your signature and your fingerprints? So it's one or the other. Whatever they choose, it's going to benefit our clients. And it could even benefit clients for two, uh, you know, two and a half years. So it's very, very good. And I think it's, it's a way... Um, of not upsetting our investors. We need investors in the country more than ever. Um, and this way, the waiting time that they're waiting to come for biometrics and waiting to be accepted is already being counted, which is good news. Mm, so let's wait no, for, actually... until the, the, the law is actually regulated and we will have mm. more information to share with you. Yeah, a very powerful measure, I must say. Mm -hmm. And again, very well uh, perceived, uh, yes. I think, by, by, by our clients. Um, talking about Greece, maybe, uh, I have a question here for Marius. Um, clients, families wanting to relocate to Greece. You said it's a beautiful country. I guess we can say this about everyone who's representing, you know, uh, one of them here today. Um, can family members be included in the main investor's application after a submission? Is there anything maybe that is a bit more flexible or does it have to be always everybody at the same time? No, actually, that's a very good and uh, it's also a technical question that we receive quite often. Philippe, thank you for that. Actually, yes, the main applicant uh, can submit the application and thereafter the family members, whether this is a spouse, or the children up to the age of 21, the parents with no limitation in terms of age or of financial dependency or the parents-in-law, they can submit um, uh, later uh, the application. Okay, that's interesting. So there is flexibility, uh, yes, which sure. maybe other programs do not have. Um, maybe they do. Um, I'm actually intrigued to learn from Bata about uh, uh, Antigua and Barbuda and their requirements. Um, it's not a residency program. It's a straightforward citizenship like Malta, but the processes are probably somewhat different, I would think. So maybe we start with Antigua and Barbuda, Bata. Um, can you talk us about, you know, what are the advantages of it a bit more in detail and what actually are the mandatory requirements if you want to be successful by applying? Yes. So, well, as said previously, you have to visit the island. You have to spend a week there. You have to pass the oath, ideally, while you are there. Um, and then uh, on the other side, when it comes to uh, listing the advantages of, of Antigua program over the other programs, um, we can say, number one, they're quite efficient. Uh, there are no major backlogs. There are no delays. Um, there is no lengthy bank KYC, uh, which clearly um, clearly saves time on the processing side. Uh, this program is perfectly tailored for families. Um, uh, it's uh, They are the only one who are running the family of six or more family members offer, where you invest in a specifically designated fund. Um, they are also uh, the only program which are allowing siblings to be part of uh, uh, the application, regardless of their age. And uh, they, these siblings have to be though unmarried, but they can also, from technical perspective, be divorced. Um, it, the program enjoys a great international reputation. Um, you don't read in Yellow Press any articles about them. They have no scandals. Overall, it's a great program. Thank you. Serene, uh, you heard about it with the process, the minimum requirements. Um, now looking at Malta, which again, you know, has a strong compliance ranking, I believe. The investment thresholds also on the ranking are quite high. What are the exact steps uh, if someone wants to be successful in applying for Maltese citizenship by the regulation? Okay, so um, Mezzi, I'm going to refer to it as Mezzi. It's much shorter. Mm -hmm. um, so we have four steps. Uh, for the MSD process. So we start first by the residency 
steps. Uh, we first need to request police clearance for applicants uh, before we can start step one. Uh, so once applicants have been cleared by the local police department, we can start working on the residency application of the client. Uh, we will take clients, so they will have to be physically present to attend the biometrics appointment for the residency stage. Once this has been done, they will obtain a residency card that will be issued for a period of 36 months. Once the residency card has been issued, we can move to step two and submit the eligibility application. Um, now, the eligibility application will take about six to a maximum of eight months to be reviewed by the government agency, after which we will be receiving um, the minister's approval, uh, meaning that we can then move to step three, which is the citizenship step. Um, we will again submit a third application for citizenship, which will lead us to the final um, citizenship approval. Once applicants have been approved for citizenship, this is when we will submit the last application, which is the post approval pack, um, and we will receive an invitation letter for applicants to come and swear the oath. Um, then they come and swear the oath. We go for the biometrics for the passport, and this is when the citizenship certificate is issued, and they are officially multi citizens. Um, it will take five working days for the passport to be issued if clients decide to collect it locally. They also have the option to collect the passport in any Maltese embassy around the world. So whatever works better for, for uh, our clients. You, uh, you know, thanks to your authority and competence, you just made a complicated process by design <laughs> to actually look rather smooth. And I believe one of the success stories that the firm can pride itself is by being very successful with Malta cases. Now, Bata was mentioning, you know, in, in, in Antigua Barbuda as a fund option for families. What are actually the investment options when it comes to Malta? So um, there are two options that client can choose from. Um, we call them routes, but basically they can decide to go with the 12 month option, uh, which would be for a contribution of 750,000 euros. Um, this for the main applicant, there's an additional contribution per uh, dependent. And there is the 36 month route, which is not very popular with our clients because it, it, then it becomes very lengthy as a process. And this would be at a contribution of 600,000 euros. There is also a mandatory donation of 10,000 euros to a non-governmental organization. Uh, and you would have to lease a property or purchase. It's totally up to the clients to decide to which option they want to go for. Um, to cover the residency period, which I would say would be of a minimum of uh, 14 months by the time we reach the citizenship stage and the submission. And once uh, clients have been approved and they swear the oath, they would need to lease a property or if they have a purchased property, uh, this they it needs to be kept for a minimum of five years. Mm -hmm. And they can then either, sorry, uh, resell the property or just drop the lease agreement. It's very important to know that when it comes to the property, it cannot be sublet or rented if it's a purchased property mm -hmm. for all this period of time. It has to be covered and used only uh, by the main applicant. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Property acquisition, investing into real estate, something that is always attractive, more or less, I guess, particularly in Spain where you know, the sun is shining every day. Um, but you know, Ines, tell us what investment options are actually available for clients if they would like to qualify for the golden visa. So um, one of the good things about the Spanish program is that it offers a big range of possibilities, not only real estate, but also financial assets. So um, with financial assets, the minimum requirement investment, the minimum required investment is on of 1 million in shares, uh, deposits, bank deposits, or um, funds. And then there's a 2 million minimum investment in government bonds. But then for real estate, the investment is 500,000 euros, which is quite less. And um, there's also flexibility in that because it can be a residential property, a commercial property, or even land. And the owner, can rent out this property and actually profit from it. So that is very good. Um, we've seen that obviously the best type of investment will depend on our client needs. And that's what we do. We advise them on what works best for their needs and for what they want to achieve with their investment. 
but we've seen that um, commercial real estate is really good because of the low tax compared to residential property. Um, and also the process is more straightforward. And um, there's also other types of uh, investments as hotel developments and like more structured investments that the client can make. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, all of the investments are hassle-free. There's always the option that the client wants to manage the investment or on their own, but there's also the kind of client that just wants to make an investment uh, to qualify and then move forward and they can get, you know, a revenue right back at the moment that they make the investment and then not, don't worry about it for 10 years. Um, so that's what I can say about the, the types of investment in Spain. No, I, I, thank you very much. It's, it's clear, you know, the um, ability to invest into in everywhere in Spain into real estate is just very attractive. If then the logical outcome of it is the long term, you know, residency rights. Obviously, that sounds to me like a very smart strategy and not only to me, also to a lot of our clients who are coming exactly with that inquiry. Right. Um, I would like to spend maybe another eight, maybe 10 minutes on uh, talking, you know, about these programs a bit more technical. And then we're going to go into the Q&A session. I can see the chat room is filling up. So thank you very much yeah. for your participation there. Um, but I have a question for you for Grenada, uh, and then I will actually transfer back to Greece. Um, if an individual has successfully qualified uh, for the Grenadian citizenship, citizenship, excuse me, and the passport, will future spouse and children also be allowed to get theirs? How does this descendancy work out? Uh, what conditions are there? What can you tell us? Yes, actually, it's a, it's a common question. We get it all the time. Um, in other islands, just, just to, to be uh, a bit more technical, in other islands, there is a process where you add dependents to a closed application. So the process is called an addition of a dependent to a closed application. And the reason for that name is actually that you have to pay for it. And it can range anywhere from ten to $50,000, depending on the age of, 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 of a person being added. But in Grenada, they follow uh, a different process. Uh, so for future children, it's citizenship by descent. And for future spouses, it's citizenship by marriage. And uh, unlike the other Caribbean countries, there are no additional charges other than the passport fee and a small government processing fee. Uh, it's in range of a couple hundred of dollars. So definitely for those who are younger well, at the time of applying and planning on having uh, a family in the future, it comes with less cost. Interesting. Very interesting proposition, I must say. So the flexibility differences there uh, might meet different needs and different requirements by the families. And I'm glad to hear that you know everything inside out technically. So thank you very much for that. Um, Marius, let's talk Greece. Uh, let's talk about the bank account uh, requirement. In fact, you said earlier, you know, it has become a bit easier, but exactly how long, how long on average does it take for a foreign investor to open those bank accounts in Greece? Nowadays, uh, Philip, um, we are working with all um, the four uh, systemic slash uh, public uh, financial institutions in Greece. And uh, just to mitigate any concerns, because as you know, Greece has gone through a, a very big financial crisis. Um, uh, the Greek banks actually are now very well capitalized and they enjoy uh, very high uh, tier capital ratios, even uh, sometimes higher than Swiss banks. And um, the banks, so they have, they have uh, because a lot of... Um, yeah, investors, especially Greek industrials, have brought back their money into, into these banks. So now the process, uh, based on our experience to open a bank account, which is not a prerequisite for the Greek Golden Visa, but it's highly recommended, it will take um, about one month. Okay. Which I think uh, it's quite... Uh, reasonable? Yes. Internationally, particularly in these days. Okay. Yes. Um, talking about you know, other options we heard about, you know, Spain, mm -hmm. Malta, the Caribbean, Emmy, Portugal has a myriad of pathways to yes. qualify for the golden residence uh, uh, option. There's also the different thresholds. There's, you know, less population density definition. It gets a bit confusing sometimes for, <laughs> for clients. Maybe you can, you know, uh, help us to understand the maze a little better there. Okay. So um, the low density um, area, 
is very interesting, actually, because what the government is trying to say to the investors is, please go invest in uh, the interior of Portugal when nothing, not much is happening, okay? I would say interior of Portugal is the closest there to, to Spain, okay? So not the big city centers. So if you invest in a low population area, and how do they define it? They define it as 100 inhabitants per square kilometer, okay? So uh, the option that they have is the business option, which... Uh, it's not a very popular option, but I can give you the example of the first client that did a business option. He was on TV uh, almost 12 years ago. Um, he set up a, a hotel. He opened up a hotel and he had to employ 10 people. So how will this differ if you do it in a low density area? Instead of employing the 10 people, you only need to employ eight. Okay, it's because it's a 20% reduction that they give you. So a hotel is very easy because you'll always have at least eight, 10 people working every single day. Um, and there's no threshold in this business option. The, all they want is that you employ 10 uh, people, residents, of course, they have to have a residence visa, um, and register them with social security. Mm -hmm. So uh, interesting, if you want to come and live here and you know set up a business here, uh, you can have that reduction if you go into a low population area. Interesting. And I, I suppose I did some research, you know, the tourist, the statistics of Portugal, extraordinary. I think looking back at a very strong year. So who doesn't want to have a hotel or a restaurant okay. or a coffee shop and maybe then qualify, maybe basically have a have an asset and, you know, a running enterprise in a country that also generates maybe some interesting financial returns in the long run. So thank you very much for clarifying thank that. You. Okay. Going back to the Grenadian passport, Bata, you said earlier when we talked about the strength, you know, and uh, the composition of the position of the program, there's a what a US E2 treaty. What does it mean? What does it do? How does it work? Yes, uh, another another very often question we get is, uh, am I entitled to get the e US E2 tax treaty visa? Um, you are, but it's not automatic. You have to apply after you become Grenadian. Uh, you have to file an application with a U.S. immigration lawyer. And um, there are also some changes recently with uh, the timing of the of the U.S. Uh, E2 Tax Treaty visa. Uh, following the new regulations, uh, you have to be a resident in Grenada for three years before uh, uh, applying for the E2 Tax Treaty visa. So definitely much harder than before. And uh, just to clarify these misconceptions, uh, applicants and prospects are coming with, uh, it's not something you are granted automatically. You have to apply for it. You have to use uh, uh, an independent US immigration lawyer. And above all, now with the changes in 2023, you have to be a resident in Grenada for three years before applying for that visa. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, Ines, Spain again regarding the investments and the processing. And I can see that there has been a question already by one of our audience members about how fast it is. So you, you have seen on the Spain slide that that actually is a very strong asset Spain can bring to the table. Uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, there is a requirement that the government assesses an application within 20 days, uh, right. which makes me believe that once a case is submitted, I actually know in 20 days whether I receive it or not, right? So can you tell us a little bit about that? Please? Yes. So in order to apply for the residency, we first need to make the investment. So we will assist the client on making the investment. But once we have all of that settled and we submit the application, the government is obliged to respond within 20 days. If they do not respond or require extra information from the applicant, it means that it is approved by administrative silence, and then we can request that they um, give the residency to the applicant. Um, it is also very interesting from the processing point of view and how quick it is that the applicant does not need to enter the country until after approval. So they can do everything without traveling to Spain. Even the investment, we can manage that um, for the client. Um, and they only need to come to get their card issued. So they don't need to make any trips before being sure that they're already residents. 
Wow, that is actually, I think, very, very useful for some people joining this call because that's uh, an amazing advantage Spain has to offer. Now, going into citizenship stream again, Malta, Serene, um, what would you say at the end of the day are the key benefits uh, of the program? And maybe more importantly, because of its compliance strictness, who is eligible to apply and who isn't? Okay, so um, I will start with who is eligible to apply. Um, so you have to be a minimum of 18 years of age to apply for uh, the MSD process. Uh, you can, um, main applicants can add to their application their spouse, um, same, sex same sex marriage is accepted in Malta, so uh, the facto partnership as well. You can add your parents or in-laws um, as long as they are 55 years of age um, and fully dependent on the main applicant. And uh, children up to the age of 29 can be added to an application, but same, they need to be uh, fully financially dependent. Now, uh, it's very important to know that when it comes to children, uh, they need to be um, under 29 when we submit stage two, which is the eligibility stage. Once they turn 29, if they do turn 29 before we submit the eligibility stage, they will not be um, eligible to uh, continue with this application and they will have to apply separately uh, through their own application, basically. Um, so we're going to go through the benefits again, as we said before, um, quite a large number of countries to which you can have visa free or visa on arrival. Um, the healthcare system is very good in Malta. Schooling is very, very good. The university uh, is a plus for uh, children of applicants. Um, and it's a very, very convenient place to live, uh, as I've mentioned before. Uh, I'd like to touch on something that I um, forget to, I forgot sorry, to mention earlier. When it comes to the property uh, rental or purchase, there is a minimum amount um, that we need to stick to. So when it comes to the rentals, it has to be a minimum of 16,000 euros per year. Um, and then when it comes to the purchase of the property, the property has to have a value of a minimum 700,000 euros. Uh, it cannot be divided into two properties. It has to be one property and this per applicant. Right. Okay. So a bit of strictness there. Um, we, we can see. Um, in closing, uh, just building on that was Serene said, Marios, how does it work in Greece when it comes to property acquisition? Is there flexibility? Can you split properties? What can someone do to be successful with the application? Sure, sure, Philip. Uh, first of all, we have to categorize two uh, two minimum investment thresholds outside of Athens, the two islands, Mykonos and Santorini, and the and Thessaloniki, which is the second largest town. The minimum has gone to half a million euros, and you cannot buy in terms of property acquisition more than one unit. The rest of Greece, which basically represents 99% of the country geographically, the minimum is 250,000 euros, uh, Philippe, and you can buy as many units as, uh, as you want. So it's very flexible in terms of property acquisition. But having said that in mind, uh, Philippe, I wish to reiterate that soon enough, there will be changes in the law in terms of property acquisitions, and the minimum investment thresholds are going to increase. It's not certain to what extent and when, but our recommendation is that if clients want to apply under the current minimum threshold, which is very low of 250, uh, they should do it as soon as possible. I think that's very important, uh, what you just raised there, Marius, grateful for that. Also, I believe very valuable for everybody on the call. So there's a bit of an urgency. If, if the program itself and its strength suits your family, suits your strategy, and you wanna become a property owner in Greece, um, now is the time to move, right? If I, I get that right. Um, thank you very much, uh, dear panelist. Um, that's very, very useful, very insightful. I would like to go into the chat and allow some of those uh, questions that have been asked to be answered. So um, some question pertaining the Portuguese program mm -hmm. and are there any current difficulties for Chinese or Far East investors also with regards to currency control, maybe capital control. Have you seen anything there? I believe that once a bank account is open and the due diligence has been done um, on the investor that there is no hindrance to be taken into account. But maybe, Amy, you can just elaborate on that quickly. Yes, that's true. So um, the, the client needs to open a bank account. 
uh, in Portugal, once a bank account is opened, then uh, invest. Like uh, other uh, programs, yeah, you first have to do the investment and then we can submit to the to the government. Now, I do have to touch about uh, buying real estate. Uh, from October last year, 2023, the government stopped the real estate uh, for golden visa holders, for golden visa applicants. So you, it, you cannot buy a property and use that property to submit your application. Uh, you mm -hmm. need, need to do another, you've got five options that you can do, whether it's a donation, whether it's um, investment funds, whether it's business option, there's other options that you can choose from. But one thing is for sure, uh, they have not uh, forbidden the investors or foreigners to buy real estate in Portugal. You can still buy real estate in Portugal. We've got many clients coming here now and um, doing a, the investment fund option, for example, or the donation, and then buying a property. And then you can buy whatever you want, wherever you want, at whatever price range you want. So they have not forbidden any uh, foreign nationals to buy real estate in Portugal. You can still do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the other question also regarding Portugal, I'll take the opportunity uh, Philip, if you allow me, uh, is about citizenship. How long does it take? We have just given the passport to a, a Turkish a client in December, and his application took 15 months. I do believe things are um, going to, you know, maybe even slow down a little bit. Let's see with this new government. So let's say from 18 to 24 months is the average, but we did have a, a client that took 15 months to get his citizenship application. So also to remind you, the one thing is doing the golden visa, which is a temporary uh, visa visa for five years. Everyone needs to have a temporary visa for five years. And then citizenship is another separate application. Okay. So separate entities will analyze the applications. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. I would like to just quickly stick with Portugal because we have another question. Okay. We have many, many more actually. I want to run through them. That's we why we popular. Six more minutes. <laughs> um, just quickly on the process mm. because it's relating to the compliance and the KYC process. Uh, someone in the chat is asking what is actually the KYC process for Portugal. I think the question here sits within the required bank account opening uh, that you have to do in Portugal as part of the process, right? That's true. It's the bank. It's the bank that does the um, the due diligence for the government. So if the bank, um, you know, ticks all boxes and opens your bank account, then that's fine. OK, uh, we are having um, some difficulties with uh, nationalities, even being born in the USSR. Uh, so it has to be looked at case by case. But the if they are tightening, uh, the banks are getting stricter in Portugal. OK, um, the European Central Bank is putting some pressure on Portugal. So we need to make sure that our clients all, you know, you tick all the boxes and you make sure you give them all the documents that they request. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, a question out of the chat regarding Spain, if I may quickly, Ines, uh, do you become automatically a tax resident when you are a good and visa holder? I think that's a pretty straightforward answer, please. No, uh, fortunately, due to the fact that uh, the Spanish program does not require you to spend any time in Spain, you do not automatically become a tax resident because tax residency is seen um, from the point of view of the amount of time that you spend in Spain and whether or not Spain is your main center of uh, generation of income. So basically, even if you're a uh, resident by investment in Spain, if you do not spend more than 183 days per year in the country, you will be considered a non-resident from a tax point of view. And um, also, even if you do decide to reside in Spain for over 183 year, that days a year, um, there are options and tax regimes that can benefit um, those who reside, decide to relocate completely in Spain. So there are... Um, very good options for non-residents uh, who want to move here after. Also, I, I believe it's important to mention that the residency in Spain does allow you to have economically ec economical activity in the country and to work and study in Spain. So in any case that you are generating an income in Spain, that income that you generate in Spain will be would be taxed but not the income that you generate abroad if you're not spending more than 183 days in the country. 
Very important. Thank you very much for that, Ines. Um, maybe one final question. Well, we have three more. I'm trying to run them all uh, if we can. Uh, towards Bata, there's a question uh, whether there's a difference. I assume I'm interpreting the question, Indian clients, Pakistani clients, how quickly can get through the process for Grenada or Antigua uh, for, I assume, the citizenship process? Right. Well, might be a typo that uh, they're referring to citizenship by investment. Uh, the timings uh, used to be four to six months, but uh, due to the popularity of the programs, it's fair to say that today it takes anywhere between six to eight months. Uh, and then if the, the, the attendee really wanted to know, is it possible to be a resident there? Yes, once you are a citizen, you have the right to live uh, there uh, throughout the whole year. And with some, uh, um, with some uh, specific exemptions, also live in the whole CARICOM region. Excellent. Thank you very much. One question that comes up sometimes by clients interested in the Caribbean. Donation, real estate, Antigua, Grenada. From your point of view, again, having served hundreds of clients, is there anything clients should consider? Maybe a quick risk mitigation analysis here? Well, it's a personal preference. For uh, for some applicants who are looking for a one-off, uh, no, further, no further commitment transaction, the donation uh, to their national development fund uh, is the most convenient solution. Others who are more inclined over the investment might consider the, the real estate offers there. As, as said, both islands are super touristic and, and um, you know, owning a property is a lucrative business there. But uh, fair to say, there is a mandatory period to uh, hold that property. It ranges from five to seven years, again, depending on the jurisdiction. And uh, there are also some further commitments. So. To summarize, it's a personal preference. Some clients mm -hmm. prefer to donate and they're done with it. Those who are more investor orient, invest, investing oriented would uh, definitely go for the real estate. And there's some good options, good deals there. And your practice and your colleagues would sit down with the client and analyze the, the situation thoroughly to make sure that clients make the right choice, right? Absolutely. We we are very transparent. We are uh, we are honest and we deal only with facts uh, we also give the track record from previous cases and then ultimately it's on the client to decide which way he will go mm. we have one minute left and i would uh, i want to i need to of course award the winner of the total points in terms of you know uh, uh 77 malta's ranking the last question that came up um serene very important for clients who are maybe far away whether southeast asia or in the us or south america wanting to start and commence the process what are the physical stay requirements throughout the process? Because that obviously can have an impact on the entire planning of a family. But from your point of view, how should we deal with that question? Well, um, to start with, when it comes to the, the two times that clients need to be physically present for their appointment, this would be twice, um, for the once for the residency appointment and once for the appointment to swear the oath of allegiance, depending on the age of the children, they would need to be physically present. Um, there is also a post obtention of the residency card, a mandatory stay of 21 days in Malta. And this is for the main applicant, the spouse and the adult dependents. Minor dependents do not have to come and spend the days uh, on the island. Now these 21 days, um, have to be done by everyone, as I said, um, uh, any adult applicant. And uh, they can be done in as many, um, as many times as they want. Uh, and also, um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, I forgot, sorry. I got blocked on that one. <laughs> hold, your, hold your breath. No worries. We have another question. Maybe I address it to Ines because that's regarding Spain. Um, we touched base on it just quickly, but I would like maybe, you know, overspend the time in giving a specific answer to the question. Um, what can be included from a dependent perspective for the Spanish program? So, you know, can I include my grandmother or my children or, you know, my brother-in-law? And what, what can I, what can't I? And then also the access to a healthcare education just quickly, maybe in, you know, 30 seconds. Yeah. What are the benefits? So, um, spouse or civil common law partner can be included, uh, including unmarried civil partnerships or same-sex unions, um, all economically dependent descendants, meaning all children, even they, if they're over 18, as long as they're still financially dependent on the main applicant, uh, and economically dependent parents over the age of 65. 
So those would be the, the people who could be included as dependents. And yes, they can access the public health care and public education that is great in Spain and have access to that great quality of life that Spain has to offer. Thank you very much. With that, I think we have provided a lot of information. That is all. Okay, back to uh, me, Philippe, actually. <laughs> oh, then please, please tell us, enlighten us. <laughs> so about the 21 days, sorry about that. Um, the arrival and departure days do not count. So these have to be 21 full days uh, in Malta. So that's very important because sometimes our clients come and they do not complete a full 21 days, then it becomes a bit of an issue because we need to ask them to come back. And as you mentioned before, if they live in the US or in China and so on, it's a bit difficult for them to come and spend just a few days. Yeah. Here. Small detail, but very, very important. Thank important. you very much for highlighting that, Escaping Serene. Totally. Yeah, no, no problem at all. I hope we provided some value to the audience today. Again, we're going to have a second session later at 5 p.m. London, UK time. Um, if we missed out something, uh, you know where to find us. Please go on the website. You can contact us any given time. The firm is working 24-7. Um, it has been uh, a pleasure to you know, get everybody together. I would like to thank all of you panelists to join uh, this session and unpack a little bit our investment program Bible, the blue book, the publication that uh, really contains a lot of uh, information and it's very useful. Anyone who would like to play, go on the website, download it, uh, go on Amazon, purchase it. And with that, I conclude and I'm looking forward to seeing you all for the next session, either later today or any given time. Thank you very much. Thank you.